It's been a year since the first COVID-19 patient was identified in Singapore. Since then, more than 59,500 Singaporeans and residents have been infected. What's it like to survive COVID-19? Hear from two recovered patients, Case 38 and Case 180. Plus, a medical expert on the long-term impact of COVID-19. This is Talking Point. Welcome all to the discussion. Julie, let's start with you. One year on, I know that you are still suffering from some side effects. Tell us more. I still cannot smell. When I smell durian, it, it smells like garbage dump. So I, I was trying to figure out why. As usual, I went to Google and then it's called phantom smells. Basically, it was a memory that's 30 years ago. To me, durian smelled like garbage dump. So I actually captured a memory of the smell. So that happened in the last few weeks. But previously, there was no sense of smell. So imagine, which I think is a blessing, because I walk into uh, the public toilet, no smell, which is a great thing. Um, body odour, no smell, which is also another great thing. I'm hoping that you'll come back, and I think I kind of get a little bit of it now, but I'm not associating it correctly. What about taste then? So I, I stay away from some food now, simply because I cannot smell it and then the enjoyment is actually taken away. Simon, you were discharged from the hospital in April and uh, have there been any lingering effects of COVID-19? I was, I was fortunate in a sense um, that the, the only time that I was really frightened was a couple of days after my discharge, I was trying to go back to running. It was a shock to me because I couldn't run more than a couple of minutes, heart rate was going up. I had a heart rate monitor on me. Yeah, so that was pretty frightening. So I stopped. I stopped and uh, just wondering whether this was going to last. Did it last? No, it, it didn't. Are you perfectly normal back to your usual exercise regime now? I am, I am. How long did it take you to get here? It took me a couple of weeks. It's, it's really baby steps. Dr Lim, uh, both Julie and Simon are describing fairly different experiences. Yes. How common are these lingering effects of the virus? The lingering effect of the virus really depends on uh, which part of the organ is involved and which uh, body system. By and large, most patients will have some fatigue, muscle weakness uh, right after the infection and it takes a while for the body to recover. As for Judy's case, because it involved the nerve, the, the sense of smell is a nerve involvement, so the recovery will be longer and a little bit more unexpected. Whereas for Simon's case, he probably had muscle fatigue, uh, maybe some minor lung scarring, and that's the reason why his effort tolerance was reduced. Generally, uh, if you have infections, your body has a toll, uh, a lot of energy are used to recover, and so this is the reason why you will have fatigue. Right. Lung scarring, you can see that um, for patients when they do an x-ray, there will be shadows that appear that uh, suggest that there is a uh, lung scarring. This is another x-ray where it shows shadowing over two sides. This was scarring. So most of them will have a reduced effort tolerance. They feel breathless, they can't climb the usual flight of stairs or they can't run the usual distance. But if you are young, you are fit, Generally, our body can remodel the scars and there's a good chance it can recover. Who is more susceptible to the long-term impact of COVID? Those who are more susceptible will be patients who are more uh, elderly, uh, those who have underlying medical conditions. Oh, what about Julie's case? I mean, she's hardly an elderly and yet she's almost completely lost her sense of yeah. smell. Well, Julie's case is unique because for her, the uh, sense of smell has involved nerve. So for nerve recovery, it tends to be slower and more unpredictable. Whereas for Simon's case, uh, I think for his, his, his generally just muscle fatigue, weakness, and as a result, when he starts exercising immediately after the infection, he finds that his effort tolerance has dropped greatly. But after a few weeks of recuperation, recovery, uh, he finds that he can return almost back to normal. When will a person like Julie be able to get back her sense of smell? Can yeah. she? Well, Loss of smell from a viral infection is not uncommon. Patients who lost a smell due to a flu, they can take a few years to recover. The recovery process can be like exactly what she described, from totally loss of smell to some smell, to phantom smells, to some distorted smell. But by and large, her memory is still there. So if she continues to retrain her smell, she can have a smell stimulus to train the memory, train the organ, and over a period of time, she can recover. Julie, i got to ask you, if you can smell something, anything, what is the first thing you want to smell? Oh, wow, never thought of that. 
Uh, coffee? That sounds like a nice wake-up smell. Someone mentioned and said, that, you know, this, this, this virus is, is really getting scary. And the person said, that, you know, I'll be very careful if I were to see um, any of those people. Welcome back. We're hearing from recovered COVID-19 patients about how the virus has affected their lives. It's been a year since Julie and Simon recovered, but Julie is still suffering from the lingering health effects of COVID-19. But now I want to turn my attention to something that is festering, social stigma. And joining us for this part of the discussion, Associate Creative Director of BBDO Singapore Ad Agency, Malcolm Wee. Julie, let's start with you. I know that you've been at the receiving end of some stigmatization. Tell us more. I think uh, it, the first instance was when I was still in NCID and in the apartment that I was staying, I actually um, had some residents demanding to know which unit had the infected patient. And um, I remember speaking to the MCST chairman and uh, demanding to know why they needed to know that. And in the end, I took the stand of, if the government did not announce my name and they gave me a number, then you have no right to also tell them where I stay. So that was my first instance. I think the second instance is after um, the publicity started, I started being interviewed a few times. Um, there were people who actually felt uncomfortable with me being so open about uh, me being infected. What did they say? So I, I hear comments like, oh, you're so shameless, like um, you have the disease, you should sh just shut up and not tell everyone. I think ignorance like that comes from fear. And um, the only thing to look at it is really to forgive them and, and, and think that, you know, if, if someone is fearful, they will say hurtful things like that. Um, I have uh, friends who reject uh, meeting me. <laughs> but that's okay. I, I kind of see in, uh, in a good light as well. I mean, they are taking care of their family. This is understandable. Simon, what about yourself? Have you ever been at the receiving end? Well, the day that I was discharged, and I was, uh, was 32 days, and you can imagine my hair growing so long. <laughs> so I went for a haircut, and the, the first thing that they look at me is like, oh, you lost a lot of weight. Yeah, I see. I've been exercising. <laughs> Yeah, um, I wasn't sure how people were going to react, right? And, and someone mentioned and said, that, you know, this, this, this virus is, is really getting scary. And the person said, that, you know, I'll be very careful if I were to see um, any of those people who, who might think that uh, might be dangerous. At the point in time, I was referring to the um, foreign workers. Yeah, so I had a reaction and it was, it was sad. It was really sadness. I, I wasn't sure and I was going to be sitting there for a while. So I, I wasn't sure what's going to happen, and I, 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 just, I just kept quiet. I didn't say that I was uh, just discharged. Does it still happen today? I haven't quite felt that way. Um, you, you, you still see people very unsure. Just check with, they, they will text me and say, you know, do you have any lingering effect? Are you okay? And, and are, are, you, are you doing well? No, will you have chances of being reinfected again? So sometimes there's questions like this. That kind of make me feel that, okay, you know, people are still very wary about it. Okay, Malcolm, your ad agency ran a campaign involving uh, COVID-19 survivors. What was it like getting them to go public about their condition? There was um, a mix of, of responses that we, we got. Uh, the ones that, that said they didn't, that they didn't want to kind of be involved, it was just to maintain their privacy. Now, uh, to our surprise actually, a lot of them were quite open and were quite receptive to, to being able to voice out uh, in the campaign. I mean, uh, our intention was to educate the audience to show them how our healthcare system operates uh, in the background and put the face behind the, the, the case number. I think that that's the, the important bit as well where we humanise uh, the, the, each of the, the people that we see. They become real? Yes, exactly. It's not just another number on this list. They are aware of that, that these people are people too. And I think the rest of Singapore should acknowledge that as well because it's you, it's me, it's, it's our families. I think it's important to know that these patients, they are not a number. They also have fears. And in fact, instead of stigmatising them, we should support them to show that they can walk out of this. And even if one day you have the disease, you too can walk out of this, just like every, every, the majority of the cases. 
in terms of managing the pandemic, why is it important to prevent stigmatization? I think it's important to prevent it because people will come forward. If they are unwell, they can will seek help. They'll see their family physicians, get it checked. And uh, if they really have the disease, uh, be quarantined, um, be hospitalized early so that you don't continue to spread the disease. And hopefully with this, with a collective effort, we can all work out of this pandemic uh, as early as possible. Not every COVID-19 survivor journey is the same. For Nadia Hanim, it was her second brush with death. But the support that she received from those around her was remarkable. Because COVID-19 doesn't just affect the patient, it affects the family as well. This is Nadia's story. Nadia Hanim faced death twice in her lifetime. The first in 2009 due to H1N1. Then again in March 2020 when she tested positive for COVID-19. I'm meeting her today to ask how her experience has impacted her family. Hi Nadia. Hello. Hi, good to see you. Good to see you. How did you feel when you were diagnosed with COVID? I felt shock. Definitely shock, and most of the time it was guilt. Why? First thing that I could think of was my family, especially my young children. So I was thinking that have I passed the virus to them, and if something happened to them, I couldn't be there with them. So that's the first thing that I felt. Who in your family took it the hardest? I think my mother. She called the hospital to ask about my condition every single day. What was the impact of your condition on your children? I talked to my 10-year-old son and I asked him, how did you feel when I was hospitalised? Were you afraid? And he said, yes, I was afraid, but I didn't tell you because you were sick. But I was very, very scared. He said that, I'm afraid that you will die. I, I didn't expect him to think that way. Uh, how do you think COVID affected your family bond? Uh, we have always been a close-knitted family, but definitely it brought us closer together. My sister, she's my number one pillar, definitely. She ran errands not only for my family members, but also for our parents. I am really grateful for that. We live one block away, so what I did was when my sister was in the hospital, I went over to her place just to uh, bring gifts for the kids, but we put it outside the house. Sometimes ordering their favourite treats just to make them happy. Weren't you afraid to get infected yourself? I was actually more concerned about my nephew and niece. Yeah? Because um, they're so young and then being away from their mother must be very impactful. If there is stigma, why are you sharing your stories today? I'm doing this in part for myself. It is uh, very liberating, very empowering to be able to share my journey, my story, and for those who rooted for me as well. And um, part of it is it's, it's, it's really for people to make sense of what this is all about from the survivor's point of view. For me, it really is to encourage myself uh, as, I, as I go through this. I mean, the journey seems to be unending. It does feel like that. And um, to be able to speak up about it and to be identified with it, I think, uh, empowers me as well. So that's one. I think the other reason why I'm doing this is really because I want those who hear the story to be assured that there are people that go through this together with them if they had the virus and that there is nothing to fear. But really in an attitude of hope and knowing that many of us have survived it and that uh, there are many good things to come, even though things may seem very bleak at this point of time, yeah. Did your family also have to grapple with the stigma? My wife was put on SHN for 14 days. Uh, she was alone then. Did you worry about how she was coping with it? I mean, you're in the thick of it. You have yeah. to cope with it. Did you worry about her? It was constantly on my mind how she was uh, going through the SHN and then to make sense of when I was coming back. I told her seven days, seven became 10, 10 became 14, and after that I said, it's okay, let's wait for it to happen, and it became 32 days. So that was the uh, emotional journey at the end. It was a sense of loneliness, yeah. 
being in isolation. We didn't want to be in touch with our raw emotions because we couldn't handle at that point in time. My daughter also had to be quarantined because uh, she was the one who drove me to the hospital. I think she was fearful for my life because uh, number 38 is very new in the game and we don't know what's going on. I think for her to suddenly realise I could lose my mom was, uh, I think, a wake-up call. I think that, that becomes really real for her. When I was pregnant, I left it all to the doctors. I had no choice. Every day, the gynae calls me to ask me questions like, any bleeding, any discomfort, are you vomiting? Celine Eng Chan was 10 weeks pregnant when she was confirmed to be case number 739. She wasn't the only one in her family to be hit by COVID-19. Her two-year-old daughter was infected, so was her 58-year-old mother who ended up being hospitalised for four months. I can't imagine what it must have been like for Celine, but there is a happy ending. I'm on my way now to meet her and her baby, who is now three months old. How did you feel when you found out that you had COVID? Overwhelmed. One, I was pregnant. And two, I have a toddler with me. And who's going to take care of her? There were a lot of emotions. I wasn't worried about myself. I was worried about my child or my husband who was in close contact with me. What about your unborn child? I, I wasn't that worried because there was not a lot of a news article report out there that says that the mom can transfer COVID to the baby. Like you said, during your pregnancy, there was very little known about COVID and how it affects uh, pregnancy and the fetus. How, how did you know what to do? I left it all to the doctors. I mean, I had no choice. There was no contact with, with um, the, the outside world other than my handphone. And no one knew what was happening inside the hospital either. Every day, the gynae calls me to ask me questions like, any bleeding, any discomfort, are you vomiting? So they're quite concerned in the hospital. Tell me the, the COVID status when your baby was born. They took him out for a blood test and he, they found out that he has a little bit of uh, COVID antibodies. But we're not sure whether or not he gets any form of protection from the virus. In I think at his third month, um, blood test, they found out that he doesn't have any more COVID antibodies. Your mom was quite sick during that whole time that you had COVID and all that. How did you and your family feel? I guess for my mom, we just had to, you know, leave it to the doctors because then almost close to nothing was known about the virus. And every time the doctor report, it's always, oh, she only has 70% chance of survival and then it gets lower and then the next day, the percentage goes higher. So it's a roller coaster, right? How are you feeling right now? Relief. Really relief. And I'm very happy that I got second life. I will be taking, must have pressure in my life. Happy every day. Less worry, don't get angry. Last time I used to get angry very easily. Now I don't get angry easily. What an amazing story from Celine and baby Zach. And now I want to talk about antibodies. We know that people who have had COVID have these antibodies, but they also seem to disappear after a while. Uh, Dr Lim, does that mean that they were still immune to COVID-19? These people will not have immunity to COVID-19 because the antibodies count has dropped uh, to below a protective level. So COVID-19 survivors, do they still need the vaccine? Yes. For COVID-19 survivors, these people will need the vaccine if the antibodies count starts to drop to below protective level or if the virus mutate, they may no longer be protective against the new strains of virus. Like our usual flu vaccination, where the virus, if it keeps mutating, we may need repeated vaccinations to protect against the new strain. Have you had the vaccine? Will you take it? I did. I was given a choice to be vaccinated and I choose to be vaccinated. So I have my first jab. So one or two weeks ago. Why did you choose to be vaccinated? I want a booster shot for sure. And uh, I, I believe everyone out there should be vaccinated. I mean, I don't have any concerns as to how it's going to work. I, I believe in that. I do. Julie, yourself? I'm a subject in uh, research. So uh, I get my blood tested quite often. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I just had one last week. So in October, I received a call from the doctor who is in charge of the, uh, the research to inform me that my antibody count was actually very high which is something of an anomaly because your antibody is supposed to go down. 
So that was the last uh, news I have regards to my antibody and, and then, um, then the vaccine came and um, will I take it? I thought long and hard actually, I, I really did and I'm like, do I need to take it? You know, But I think I will, not now, I will, I will probably take it in April. Julie, you subject yourself to COVID-19 research, why do you do it? When I go and get my blood taken, I will ask the, the nurse who's taking my blood, I say, okay, so, so what do you take my blood for? And I'll ask them question. So I think that gives me an idea of where I fit in in the big picture as well. Mm. But I think most importantly, I see myself contributing to the knowledge of it. Right? I mean, we already have very little information now. Mm. If the medical practitioners or any of the researchers can find some sense of this, uh, either from an infected person or uh, someone that's going, who is recovered, um, I think that's, that's a wonderful contribution. Someone else who is also giving back to the community is Mei Tan. I got a chance to speak to her. 28-year-old Mei Tan and her friend are putting together a Lunar New Year gift bag. Nothing out of the ordinary, except that this volunteer service was born out of May surviving COVID-19. So you started Kampong Kakis mm -hmm. and in less than a year, you've got a network of more than a thousand volunteers and it was your COVID experience that prompted you to do that. Tell us more. During my hospitalisation, there was a senior uncle who was vomiting a lot and I was very worried that his health would continue to deteriorate and the nurses were rushing towards him a lot and really putting themselves at risk, you know, being in contact with uh, his bodily fluids as well. And I think that inspired me to want to do something for the community. After six days in the hospital, May and her friends Denise Tay and Michelle Lau started Kampong Kakis, matching those vulnerable in the community with volunteers who will check in on them. I think at Kampong Gakis, we're hoping that when the next pandemic happens, we have a more resilient community that can pull each other along and leave no one behind. Looks like we're all set. Mm -hmm. Shall we go? Yeah, let's go. The recipient today, a 90-year-old man who lives alone. I actually feel very lucky that I have survived COVID, especially in Singapore, and I hope to be able to use this experience to keep doing good and um, to keep growing Kampong Kakis across Singapore. Julie and Simon, how has being a COVID-19 survivor changed your perspective of life? In every sense of it, it has given me courage, really, you know, not to live in and live with anticipatory fear in the things that I do, I think to, to be able to cherish the moments and to be authentic as I would and not to be so concerned about what's going to happen, how people are going to see me or am I living up to people's expectation. I think that has given me a lot of wisdom in really wanting to live my life the way that I want to live. For me, yes, I think I'm more forgiving to others and more uh, accepting towards others as well and I, I think I see less of myself but I, I also think of uh, more of others as well because I've seen how people have thought of me and uh, sustain me, so to speak, yeah. Thank you all very much for sharing. I hope that today's program has given you a deeper understanding of what the COVID-19 survivor goes through and that during this pandemic, we all need to give one another much-needed support. Stay healthy.